From New York City for our viewers worldwide, I'm Matt Miller. We're looking to see how much investors care about bad news is good news today. The countdown to the open starts right now. We begin with the big issue, the bad news data point from yesterday. All eyes are on the labor market. It's right to be watching the labor market because we've seen some cracks forming the jolts job openings data this week falling to the lowest level since 2021. The labor market continues to normalize. Um, you know, the whisper numbers lower that than that 180,000 consensus view on, on job gains this month. I think we could see jobs kind of join the string of weaker than expected data. Joining us now to discuss is Kevin Holt. He is Invesco U.S. Values Equity CIO. And obviously, Kevin, the jolts story from yesterday is going to possibly continue tomorrow with non-farm payrolls. Um, we get some fresh economic data out this morning as well, which we're going to talk about in just a moment. But is bad news good news? Can you count on that as an investor in the stock market? Yeah, I mean, I, I do think with inflation having run you know, quite high the last couple of years that a little bit of slowness in the labor market and a little bit of slowness in general inflation probably gives us a more constructive backdrop, um, assuming it doesn't weaken too much. The job openings fell to the lowest since 2021. When I saw the headline, I was yeah. um, a little bit moved until I opened up to a five year period or a 10 year period. We have a great function on the Bloomberg that you can use ECAN yeah. go to look at all this data. And really, it doesn't look that soft. I mean, this economy still seems to be running pretty strong, you know, uh, first quarter GDP data notwithstanding. What's your view? Yeah, man, it's, it, you know, it's interesting how we've all really kind of skewed our view the last four years. But if you look over a 20 year period, you're exactly right. You know, the labor market's normalizing and we're, we're, we're not in an uncomfortable period. So I, I agree with you. Um, and we're just getting back to a normal level. Um, and maybe the last five years, you know, I think most of us would agree probably weren't normal. All right. I'm going to uh, put a pin in that right now. Um, we're going to come <laughs> back and talk to you about value stocks and investing in this market. But first off, let's go over to Michael McKee. He's Bloomberg's international economics and policy correspondent. He's got more on what to expect today and maybe more importantly, Mike, tomorrow. Well, Matt, what we're looking at today is a lower than expected number for ADP, 152,000. And the folks at the payroll processor saw big losses in manufacturing. But service industry jobs came in about at the same level they have, led by, as always, education and health jobs. Now, uh, does ADP matter? People trade on it. We saw a little bit of a trade right after it came out, but then uh, that was given back because it doesn't really predict what's going to happen next. And you look at what uh, ADP forecast, uh, the 152,000 weakest since, uh, as you mentioned, January when it was 111, but we got 196,000 jobs in the payroll report in January. So can you count on it? Probably not a whole lot. Uh, so we are focused on Friday and what we get in the payrolls report. And everybody's trying to put together all these other indicators to come up with their forecast for what's going to happen. 165,000 would be the comparable number to ADP, private sector jobs. The ISM number rose to 51.1. We have to get services, which is coming up at the uh, top of the hour, 10 o'clock uh, Wall Street time. The forecast is for not a very good number, still contracting 47.2. That's not what we saw from ADP. And the jobless claims in the survey week, 211,000, a very low number. So it does suggest the labor market has not collapsed. And we'll see if we get this total number of 185 uh, that is forecast at the moment for payrolls. Matt, you mentioned the idea of the job, the jolts job openings falling uh, and then double checking the stats. And what people have overlooked is the number of people who were hired in the month of April was up 16 percent, almost 17 percent. And that was the highest since last October. So uh, is it openings? Is it hirings? <laughs> yeah, we'll have to wait and see. It's very hard to make a guess right now. Well, Jolts is also always so fascinating. Mike, thanks very much. Michael McKee, Bloomberg International Economics and Policy Correspondent. So that's the uh, economic backdrop. Let's get back over to Kevin Holt. Um, he's the head of value equities, uh, the CIO of U.S. value equities at Invesco. And I think this is also a fascinating subject, Kevin. I mean, what is 
value right now. How do you define it? Because if I look at just a basic definition and I screen for it in my Bloomberg, growth has been on a tear versus value. I think we have a chart. Um, it's 728 in, in, the, in the Bloomberg library. We can pull that up right now. Uh, how do you define um, the stocks that you're looking at, that you're screening for? Yeah, I mean, ultimately, in most industries, it comes back to your cash flow and your ability to generate cash flow. And then what is the return on invested capital of that cash flow? So, you know, a, a gross stock, you know, may if it looks inexpensive, uh, we're going to go ahead and, uh, and act on that if we think it's below its intrinsic value. Um, you know, and then in some of the more cyclical areas, <clears throat> you know, particularly financials, <clears throat> we are looking at price to book, price to tangible book value. Uh, and those tangible book values have been depressed recently just because some of the uh, bond with rates increasing, um, some of their bond portfolios have gone down, which we view as a, as a transient issue over the next 24 to 36 months. How do you avoid a value trap? This has been a question, uh, you know, I've been asking people for 20 years, but <laughs> it's important, right, in, in, uh, in, yeah. in this line of investing with this factor. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's really the most difficult thing, but I think it comes back to your, you know, when you're evaluating your stocks, why is a stock inexpensive? There's usually three or four reasons. You, you know, we're looking at things on a three to five year period, typically, sometimes even up to seven. So, you know, why why is the stock cheap? Why does Wall Street not uh, not like it at this point in time? And do we think it's kind of a, a transient issue over that period that can reverse? Or is it something more systemic? Um, and I think, you know, one of the things that, that we like to look at, again, is cash flow. Um, because the health of the cash flow within most of these industries, if it's there, uh, it tells you really about the long term integrity of these businesses. So um, but, you know, there, there are you know, things are changing. Media industries change a lot the last 20 years. Um, so you really have to, to understand where the puck's going and not where it's been. What do you what products do you use? I mean, um, when you mention cash flow, I think about ETFs. There are a number of um, uh, uh, funds out there that you, an investor can buy and sort of set it and forget mm -hmm. it. What do you what do you invest with? In in terms in terms of uh, software services or no no in terms of uh, uh, products. I mean, do you pick single stocks? Do you like ETFs? I think no, of cows no. and calf, for example. When yeah. you talk about ca the importance of cash flow, you have, I'm sure, at Invesco some products. What do you think is the best way for maybe a retail investor to get um, a, a, a deeper hold into in into value investing? Yeah, so I, I run one of our large cap value funds. So I think individual stock picking, particularly in a market where you have such disparity between the MAGA 8 in the rest of the market. And the rest of the market's pretty reasonably valued at this point. So I think individual stock picking is key. Now that interest rates have moved up over the last two to three years, I think it's even more imperative because now that money's not free, people put more emphasis on those near-term cash flows. So I think as we move out over the next you know, five to 10 years, assuming inflation stays in this two and a half to 3% range, that's usually a pretty good backdrop for value, although it's been a little bit challenging recently with AI and uh, the GLP-1 stocks. But I, I think it's a good backdrop, but it's a stock picking backdrop and it's not a momentum backdrop. So um, if you look, you know, if you're going back 20, 30, 40 years looking at history. It's interesting. I mean, the broadening out is something we've been talking about a lot. Um, the S&P 493 or 492, I guess, if you consider um, eight stocks to be magnificent. Is that is it important to see rate cuts or because you don't see any this year, right? Well, I think we came into the year thought we would maybe possibly see one or two. Um, with that said, the, the economy has been more resilient. So um, the lower end consumers weakening a little bit, but not not that much. Uh, and the majority of the consumers are still hanging there pretty healthy. The job market we just talked about. Yeah, it's 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 not quite as strong, but it's still relatively strong relative to history. So it's kind of our expectation at this point that we'll probably do, you know, go in for a soft landing this year. Um, I personally do believe the next move is down, but I think that's probably a 2025 event. And as long as as long as we don't overheat on inflation, I think the market, you know, is in an OK spot. Um, but again, these valuation disparities between, you know, these 492 stocks and those eight stocks at the top are quite extreme. And we, and we think looking at history long term, there's some pretty good value in some of these areas. So talking to you, talking to Mike, Michael Kantrowitz yesterday, um, a number of investors make me feel like, are we in a Goldilocks situation? Is that how you feel? I mean, near, near term, I think we are um, in this Goldilocks situation because we have a little bit of inflation, which is really good for some of the cyclical areas of the market. 
Um, when we had zero interest rates, it was very difficult for financial companies to, to earn that interest income. It was earn, tough for the commodity companies to get any pricing power. So, yeah, I do think we're at this point, we are kind of in this Goldilocks scenario, and it's going to be up to the Fed to kind of determine when things do weaken economically enough that, you know, we need a little stimulus in terms of interest rates. But again, we think that's a 2025 story. So we're in a pretty good position right now, uh, knock on wood. What, what, what sectors do you like right now? If you have to pick a few, um, and we've seen some real underperformance in the S&P 500, for example, from utilities, from healthcare, um, are those that haven't done well, you know, your best picks for the rest of the year? Yeah, and I really do think there are more idiosyncratic opportunities right now. Historically, when rates were zero, you'd see a lot of cyclicals that looked inexpensive. Um, right now, there are a lot of idiosyncratic opportunities within individual sectors. So you mentioned healthcare. Uh, we think the HMOs, which are the healthcare insurance companies, look particularly attractive at this point. Uh, really within that, uh, the Medicare population, they've suffered some profitability hits. We think that'll resolve itself over a 24 to 36 month period. Um, but we think that rate of change when pricing comes out here in a few weeks, uh, June 1st, when it's set for 2025, we think that'll give the ability for those stocks a little bit better. Um, as we move into you know, some of the regional banks, we think, again, the net interest income, um, they'll be able to you know, get that through. And as long as the economy stays in an OK position, they won't have the credit risk. So we think as we move into 2025 and the stocks will start to discount that in the back half, they'll get past some of these concerns and the contagion risks that happened in 22 with the regional banks. Valuations are, are very attractive um, on, a, you know, on a historical basis. Book values are slightly depressed because of some of the bond issues we talked about earlier. So we, we, think that we think some of the regional banks have tremendous upside from this point and will start to dis discount it in the back half of the year. All right, Kevin, thanks so much for joining us. Great talking to you today. Kevin Holt there, Invesco U.S. Values Equities, uh, U.S. Value Equities CIO uh, joining us. By the way, I incorrectly said utilities was an underperformer. Actually, utilities has done pretty well. If you look at a breakdown of the groups on the S&P 500 year to date, you can see utilities is up about 13 percent. What I meant was real estate. That's been um, the real underperformer. It's actually down year to date. If you look at, again, a, a GRR, uh, a group ranked return on the S&P uh, 500, which you can run by typing SPXL1 index GRR. I want to quickly mention some breaking news on India. You know, yesterday we had so much movement in the stock market, especially uh, a, a, a huge drop in Indian stocks after uh, Modi and his party failed to win a majority and they had to reach to allies to form a government. It looks like Modi has won backing from key allies uh, to form a government. And uh, you can see some uh, what looks like a ticker tape parade footage uh, here. They had meetings uh, today all day long and um, they've come up with an agreement. So he will be able to form a coalition government to rule in India. All right, let's talk about the stocks moving ahead of the opening bell this morning. Abigail Doolittle joins us with that. Abby? We do have some gains for the indexes this morning, Matt, of course, and helping out CrowdStrike, the cybersecurity firm. These shares are rallying in a big way, up 10.4%. They put up a big beat and raise quarter. Analysts impressed by the company's strong execution in a slow quarter. This stock has really been outperforming the space, up 20% into today. Now, you were just mentioning uh, AI, or you were mentioning utilities, I should say, and one reason utilities have been outperforming despite the competition from yields being up, it's that possibility that AI could drive the need for power. Well, Hewlett Packard really benefiting from AI as well, up 16% in the pre-market, heading to its best day since 2016. Apparently, their AI server sales have really been very, very strong, providing a nice tailwind. To the downside, though, Dollar Tree down 1.9%. They basically put up a mixed quarter. They maintain their full-year net sales, but they are talking about the possibility of strategic alternatives for the family dollar brand early days, they don't know, but investors do not seem very impressed that stock down 1.9%. All right. Very interesting stuff, Abigail. We're going to talk a little bit about um, AI chips in servers. If you don't have the servers, do you really need um, the chips? Coming up, we're going to talk about Elon Musk diverting some of those chips from Tesla to Twitter, now known as X. Debate in terms of the the sourcing of AI talent, where it goes, whether it goes to XAI or whether it goes to Tesla. That conversation coming up, this is Bloomberg.
be a debate in terms of the the sourcing of AI talent, where it goes, whether it goes to XAI or whether it goes to Tesla, and the allocation of resources and time. We are surprised how much implied value Tesla is getting for their autonomous and AI efforts without, without a lot of tangible data to support it. All right, Elon Musk apparently diverting AI chips from NVIDIA away from Tesla, a company that he runs, um, over to X, another company that he runs, but with different, obviously, minority shareholders and um, different expectations. He said on X, Tesla had no place to send the NVIDIA chips to turn them on, so they would have just sat in a warehouse. So if you take him at his word, I think that that makes sense. Joining us now is Bloomberg's Detroit Bureau Chief, David Welch. David, you know, there's a couple of issues going on here. One is the resourcing of uh, the allocation of resources. And the other is a leader of, you know, different companies. And he has a different masters in a sense, uh, or, or at least different minority shareholders. Let's talk about the, the first first. What's the chip story? How many chips did he divert? You know, how important is it for those to be at Tesla? What is he doing with them at X? The, look, the, the whole issue with chips gets down to how far along is Tesla with AI and with this you know, self-driving vehicle and, and, and the supercomputing that is required to make all of that work. Tesla stock wasn't doing so well earlier this year and, and, and has been slumping for a while because EV sales haven't been doing that well. The Cybertruck has not been a hit. They haven't sold that in big numbers. So there, there were two theories when Elon came out with the self-driving uh, vehicle that he's going to talk about in August. One is he's a master of diversion and marketing and he kept the narrative going that Tesla's not a car company, it's a tech company. And the other is, hey, they really have something here. And, and, and the latter won out, so the shares have run up. And anything that indicates that they're not ready to push ahead with AI and with self-driving, and in this case, it's diverting chips from Tesla to X, gets shareholders uh, a bit concerned. There might be something next week that Elon says that gets the stock back up again uh, in, in relation to all this, but right now, it is raising concerns because there hasn't been any real proof that they've got vehicles out there that can drive themselves. And a lot of companies worked on them for a long time, showed demos, and ended up tripping over themselves with this. So if, if Tesla can actually have a self-driving vehicle that works really well, that would be huge. But there's a lot of doubt because companies like GM's Cruise, Waymo, they've had stumbles with this, and, and, and it takes a long time to develop. So it's all part of this narrative whether or not Tesla's really making progress in that area. Well, and the, the other uh, issue, which I think is all the more fascinating because of the huge numbers involved is uh, how does he please shareholders of Tesla as well as shareholders in Twitter, uh, SpaceX, um, the Neuralink company, you know, the Boring company, um, especially when scarce resources that he needs for each of these companies, you know, he diverts to one or the other a week ahead of a vote on his pay package, a $56 billion pay package we heard from uh, Ron Barron on CNBC this morning that he's going to support that pay package. Marcy Frost over at CalPERS said she's not going to support that pay package. Doesn't this highlight an issue, um, a, you know, weakness uh, for the Tesla CEO? It does. Uh, well, so it's sort of a, a threat to him, really, because you've got you've had this concern for quite a while with Elon that he's got all of these different companies and. It was always sort of overlooked with Tesla because Tesla was a hot growth company, mostly because EV sales were doing great. When that slows down, he comes up with an AI story, and, and, and look, it may very well come true that he's got great uh, self-driving technology, but we're not seeing the growth from Tesla that keeps the stock multiples this high, and if he can't do that, then his shareholders are unhappy, and, and that's where the controversy is. And, and, and Tesla's once again a battleground stock. You've got those who think Elon uh, has a great story and a great company, and he's got to keep pushing that. If he doesn't, they'll be very disappointed. And you have others who doubt him, and, uh, and, and, and that's where the fight is. And that extends to this pay package too, right? Because if he doesn't deliver, then people are going to be very upset that he's making this much money. The other issue is uh, for Tesla, an affordable car, right? That's long been the goal, and that was, I think, pushed out um, by Musk and then brought back by Musk. Yes, we are going to make an affordable car, especially, well, lucky for him, we don't have to compete with China, right? Because um, they have a pretty good one in the BYD Seagull. Is Tesla going to be able to make an electric car a, a green choice for Americans who don't want to shell out 40, 50, 60 grand? 
They could certainly do it. Tesla has the technology, they've got the battery, uh, they've got the software, they're, they're a leader in all of that. They're, they're really the only American company, maybe the only global company that can compete with the Chinese when it comes to cost and comes to battery development. So they could do it. The question is, do they really want to this soon? Because one of the problems they've had is their multiple stock multiples come down is because their margins have come down because they've cut prices and and that's been uh, you know has really battered the stock. So does Elon Musk really want to make this cheap car that's going to have lower margins, going to bring in lower profits, and and basically water down uh, his stock multiple again? I think that's uh, maybe what this is really all about. He did say look that they're still going to do this, but. He was pretty vague about that, and, and, and the, the assumption on the street now is that the timeline laid out for the Model 2 for the cheaper car is, is pushed out indefinitely until we get more specifics from him. And I think it's really wait and see whether or not they do this car and when it actually comes to market. David, thanks very much. David Welch there is our bureau chief out of Detroit. Uh, great catching up with you. Hope we get you back on the program again soon. Obviously, I love talking about cars. Coming up, the morning calls. And then later, Katrina Dudley joins us from Frank Franklin Templeton on why she expects a soft landing for the economy. This is Bloomberg. Now for our morning calls, a look at some of the analyst recommendations on Wall Street this morning. First up is Barclays, upgrading applied materials to equal weight. The analysts citing an uptick in demand from China, so that's a hold equivalent. Next up, Gordon Haskett upgrading Instacart to an actual buy. The analysts saying there's evidence of increasing orders in the second quarter. And finally, Boston Beer. The company behind Sam Adams is getting upgraded at Morgan Stanley to equal weight. That's a hold equivalent. The analyst says there's a strategic halo on the stock, given recent M&A rumors with Suntory. And there's also a lot of talk about cannabis uh, companies interested in Boston beer. Coming up, Katrina Dudley of Franklin Templeton joins us around the opening bell as we look ahead to Friday's payrolls report. Will it continue to show us a Goldilocks scenario this is Bloomberg. This is the countdown to the open. I'm Matt Miller. Moments away from the start of trading. We do have futures up across the board. S&P futures uh, up about a half a percent right now. NASDAQ 100 futures up a little more, eight tenths of one percent. One of the stocks uh, that we're going to watch at the open. Actually, first, let me get to the let me get to the euro. 108. I'm going to guess. Yes, 108.86. It's been stuck there for quite a while. Don't forget tomorrow we're going to have Christine Lagarde in the ECB on this program. Uh, the 10 year yield right now at 430.84. So that continues to come down. That should be a catalyst for stocks. And NYMEX crude right now up about a half a percent at $73.60. Now I will get to uh, one of the stocks we're watching at the open, which is Dollar Tree. The U.S. consumer still in focus for us. The company said it's reviewing options for its family dollar business, which could include a potential sale or a spinoff. That makes a big difference to investors. Abigail Doolittle is here with more. Abby? It could make a big difference to them. Right now, though, the stock is uh, lower. Matt, investors not really digesting this message so well. They are saying that it's early stages, down 1.5% right now. And if you recall, they bought Fit Family Dollar back in 2015 for $9 billion. That brand is more grocery oriented. So that could be a piece of the strategic thinking. They did announce recently that they're closing a thousand stores. So they're clearly thinking of ways to shore up that side of the business relative to the quarter that they reported. It was mixed. They put up a small miss uh, for adjusted earnings of $1.43 sales of $7.62 billion. Uh, that was a small beat. Importantly, they did maintain the full year sales guide. But I think that this uncertainty and also questions of when this time period, when we have Walmart outperform because we have folks flocking to Walmart for cheaper prices. Why aren't they flocking in the same way to these two stores? That could be another reason this stock is not performing quite so well yet, Matt. Yeah, very, of its lows. yeah very interesting uh, story there because we have seen these 
uh, higher income consumers come down to Walmart, um, maybe from Target, for example, but not going down to the dollar stores yet. That's again, kind of this Goldilocks scenario, Abigail. And do we see that across other spaces? Uh, that's an interesting question. So when I think about it, and, and it's, I think it's probably that shopping experience at Family Dollar and Dollar Tree that has maybe not attracted uh, the higher end consumer. I mean, in terms of other spaces, a comparable doesn't come to mind, but in retail overall, it's been so mixed in terms of some consumers flocking to some of the niche brands, uh, such as Birkenstock. On the other hand, Abercromb and Abercrombie and & Fitch, but then American Eagle didn't do so well. And then Target, that's the big puzzle. That store really quite right in the middle of, uh, I guess, the Walmart and the Dollar Tree, and consumers not really flocking there either. It seems like Walmart's really the company uh, cleaning up in this environment. And to your point, a lot of that has to do with their online presence. All right, Abigail Doolittle, thanks very much for that. Let's turn to tech right now because Alphabet announced a new CFO to replace Ruth Porat, who announced last year that she would be stepping down from the role. Ed Ludlow has more from San Francisco. And then, Ed, we can talk. I want to talk to you for a moment about Tesla um, as sure. well. First, first Google, um, what's the story with the new CFO and uh, how does Google look right now? It's a really interesting appointment. Anna Ashkenazi was at Eli Lilly for 23 years. She'd served as Eli's uh, CFO from 2021, uh, had quite broad responsibility uh, over uh, the commercial business, other business PL leaders. And as you said, Ruth Porat announced last July that she would step down from the CFO role. And in the interim, she has been acting as president and also chief investment officer, more broadly thinking about how Alphabet and, and Google invest in the infrastructure needed for artificial intelligence, but also engaging with regulators, thinking about uh, Alphabet's uh, or Google's moonshot bets, its other investments in more nascent technology areas. And that's where Anna Ashkenazi coming in as CFO is quite interesting. Our colleagues at Bloomberg Intelligence, particularly Mandeep Singh, have this idea in their reaction note that this kind of lines up really well with some of the parallel areas Google's looking at, namely healthcare. You know, there is a high degree of overlap between the work being done on large language models and drug discovery or uh, you know, looking at genetics, DNA, uh, assessing treatments for, for rare diseases. So that could be an area that she comes in. But I've been asking Ruth Porat every quarter for a whole year who's going to replace her. And we finally have our answer. And the stock's up eight tenths of a percent in reaction. All right, let's get over to the Tesla story because this sure. is kind of the parallel I was thinking about with the consumer, right? In retail, Walmart says it's getting the higher income consumers um, looking for a deal, but they're not going down to the family dollar or the uh, stores, um, the, the even cheaper equivalents. In cars, you see kind of the same thing because, you know, we were talking with David Welch about the uh, $25,000 yeah. Tesla, which isn't there yet, but they're not even selling very many of the $35,000 Teslas. Consumers are still opting for one step up from that. Yes, we, we've done some really detailed reporting on this. The Model Y uh, is the best selling vehicle in the world, basically. But in the United States, the base variant of it, which is single motor, is the one they sell the least volumes of, largely because there's no demand for it, but also because of the supply chain in the United States, it's not really worth Tesla's while to make that base variant. Now, compare and contrast with China, the single motor base variant is the best selling Model Y in that country. Why? Because the supply chain allows Tesla to make it more profitably, which is why its global mix is important. But going back to what you were discussing with David, you know, there is no single cheap $25,000 EV coming from Tesla. What we've reported is that they did a lot of work at the component level to lower the cost of the existing lines, Y and 3. And starting in early 2025, as Elon Musk verified on the earnings call, a big part of that is working out that single motor variant of Model Y from a supply chain and component uh, perspective, making it attractive for the consumer, from a sort of a performance standpoint, but also having a margin profile which is palatable to Elon Musk, right? He still wants to make money. Yeah, it's a very interesting 
and uh, kind of a nuanced story, but very interesting. And you've done such detailed reporting on it. I recommend people go to the Bloomberg uh, terminal or Bloomberg.com and check out your Thank reporting you. or watch your program, obviously. Uh, Ed is the anchor <laughs> yeah. of Bloomberg Tech, which kicks off at 11 every weekday. Now, as we count down to the ECB decision coming up tomorrow, investors are growing more concerned that the central bank is facing a similar inflation challenge to the Fed. Joining us to talk a little bit more about that is Katrina Dudley, senior investment strategist at Franklin Templeton. Um, Katrina, we're in this spot where it's like not too hot and not too cold. Is that the same place that Europe finds themselves? I think you, you're describing Goldilocks. And, and, and as an investor, that's a great place to be because there's a lot of certainty when things are not too overheated and companies are scrambling to do things and that they're not too cold, meaning there's not a lot of demand. So Goldilocks, in my opinion, is a really great place for the economy to be in. And I do think you mentioned the Fed. We really do have the Fed to thank for the fact that we're in this position because they have really looked at the data been data dependent, and they've been responsible, in my opinion, for this kind of soft landing that we're, in, we're anticipating. So I, I was talking to Kevin Holt from Invesco earlier, he's CIO there for um, U.S. Value, and he doesn't think we're going to get any rate cuts. He thinks we are in a Goldilocks scenario uh, right now. Maybe inflation continues on the path down, and you don't see the cracks in the labor market that we're all worried about. Do you feel like the U.S. economy is in the same place? I think the U.S. economy probably has room for one rate cut, um, and it's just more of an adjustment type of rate cut. It's not a rate cut in response to the economy going down significantly. So it's a different expectation. I think it's more a recognition um, that rate cut will be that inflation is under control. And I think that that is why the Fed will do it. Um, and that's why I do think the Fed will do that one rate cut as a signal to the market that we have really tackled that inflation pro um, pro problem that that has been part of the narrative for such a long period of time. What do you think about um, the consumer right now? We've been talking so much about the consumer as we wind up earnings season. Obviously, we get all these retail uh, uh, companies out with outlooks that that seem, you know, um, a, a little bit uh, a little bit dreary, but not like it's the end of the world. And obviously, with interest rates this high, you would expect a weaker consumer. They spent off their savings um, that they, got, that they uh, boosted up from the pandemic. How do you view the U.S. consumer? I think that there's a couple of things. In terms of talking about the impact of interest rates, I think we need to separate. The fact is that many homeowners were able to lock in very low interest rates and mortgage costs. Now, the downside of that is that there's probably slightly lower labor mobility because people are locked into their home and the fact that if they were to move, the cost of refinancing would be high. Um, in terms of the rest of the economy, where we are seeing those high impact, high interest rates having an impact is really in that low and consumer. And they're the ones who are not yet in the housing market, for example. Um, you're seeing businesses react. And that, to me, is really a good sign. So think about a McDonald's, which is really starting to cater their menu to a much more cost-conscious consumer. Now, I think that that's what we expect. You look at Walmart. Walmart has not only positioned itself well in terms of its retail physical footprint, it's also expanded its online offering and really invested into that so that it can adapt to this new reality. Um, what you've mentioned, Target is another company. And I think Target is in a very difficult position, as you've indicated, because it's kind of stuck in the middle. Um, the you know, You've seen a number of store closings there in you know with, with leases that have got long-term tails on them. Um, but I do think that, you know, that Target can, with the right offering, muddle through this. But I think that, as you say, Walmart is probably better positioned. What's your view for the jobs number tomorrow, Katrina? I think the, uh, the, the consensus is 190. The whisper is a little bit less, 185. Um, how important is it? And, and what's it going to show us? I think that the jobs number needs to come in probably close to consensus because we've seen some other weakness in other data points. So if you look at the ISM number, you look at the order number, they've come in slightly weak. Um, the stronger jobs number also would be positive as we look at manufacturing. And the reason I mention that is that you know, manufacturing companies have been complaining about a labor shortage. So if they're now starting to find labor, it would show up in that jobs number and it'll also show up you know, with a bit of a a, a lag in more positive manufacturing data. So I actually hope we come in around that 185 number. 
All right, Katrina, great talking to you. Thanks so much for joining us. Katrina Dudley there, senior investment strategist over at Franklin Templeton. I, uh, I just pulled up the WIS, W-H-I-S function on um, the Bloomberg terminal, and I do see the survey is for 185. Right now, the whisper number is for 170. We have breaking news right now coming from the SEC in terms of hedge fund fee disclosure rule. It's been struck down uh, by the court, and we're going to bring you more on this story. Obviously, uh, hedge fund um, investors and uh, hedge fund managers are uh, among our biggest viewers. So uh, the SEC hedge fund fee disclosure rule has been struck down by a U.S. court. You won't get um, too much transparency or uh, 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 as much transparency maybe as you would have there. We're going to break it all uh, down for you. Coming up, we're going to talk about deal making picking up in private equity. The deal flow in the first half of last year compared to the first half of this year, um, there's clearly a, a pickup in activity. There is also pressure on asset managers and sponsors to realize assets, to distribute money back to investors. All right, we're live at the Super Return Conference in Berlin, Germany. Next, this is Bloomberg. Breaking PMI data crossing the terminal, as well as a rate cut out from the Bank of Canada. Let's go to Bloomberg International Economics and Policy correspondent Michael McKee. Uh, so, Mike, there's so much breaking right now. Um, I guess we'll start with the PMIs. We can start with the PMIs or the Bank of Canada. They both may have an impact on the markets, although the PMI is a little less so. Remember last week when the manufacturing number came out for the PMI for the United States, it caused a big market reaction stronger than expected. The services PMI comes in uh, exactly as expected and unchanged from the prior number, 54.8. The composite at 54.5 is touch stronger than the 54.4 last month. But it isn't telling you much about any changes in the economy, and that's what people are looking for. Watch the ISM services number at the top of the hour. Now to the Bank of Canada. They are the first G7 country to cut interest rates, lowering their main rate to 4.75 percent, a 25 basis point cut. Bank of Canada Governor Tiff Macklem saying that it is reasonable to expect further cuts if inflation eases. Now, inflation is running about 2.7 percent, has not moved much in recent months. Same story there as in the United States. Uh, the markets were expecting a cut, although there are some who say that it may be a bit premature. Uh, the governor says that inflation progress is going to be uneven and that risks remain. That is sort of the same story we have heard from Jay Powell. The Fed meets next Wednesday, a week from today. No move expected from the U.S. Central Bank, though, Matt. All right. Uh, very interesting stuff. The first G7 uh, central bank to cut Bank of Canada down to 475 and uh, more cuts. It's reasonable to expect more cuts on the way. Michael McKee, thanks very much for that. Now, let's talk about deal making poised to accelerate this year, according to private equity leaders at the Super Return Conference in Berlin. Danny Berger is there now and joins us with the co-president of General Atlantic. Danny. That's right, Matt. Thank you so much. I'm joined by Gabriel Caillou. As you say, the co-president of General Atlantic also heads up the EMEA business and is head of climate, too. Gabe, thank you so much for joining today. Thanks for it's having me. It's great to see you. Look, we are in this moment where it feels like something is happening, that the animal spirits are out there. The data, mm -hmm. about a 25% pickup in deal-making from the end of last year. But last year was rock bottom. So where are we actually right now? in the deal-making environment. Yeah, listen, it's interesting. I, first of all, thanks for having me. Uh, you have me on every year, and it's, it's interesting. If you think about where we were two years ago, I think everyone was anxious about how far can it fall? What is the rate, the rate environment really going to do to valuations? I think last year, the big question was, does your model as an investor still survive in this new environment? And I think what we've seen in our business is actually the last two years have been pretty good years, but we're seeing now a deal-making environment that's probably more favorable than any time in my career. Uh, because there's been this really healthy reset in the market. And you've heard me complain more than once that during the 2021 bonanza, what was challenging was not only valuations, but it was the way competitors behaved, right? Too much capital, too fast, too easy. That's been sucked out of the market. And we're back to 
doing deals, I almost want to say the good old-fashioned way, where you select a great entrepreneur, you convince them you're the right partner, and you help them build a great business. Well, it felt like everyone and their mother built a growth equity deal, a de- growth equity platform at, yeah. at some point. So some of that backed off? A lot, a lot. Mm. So And for good reason. Listen, there's a lot of great firms out there. I, I think they underappreciate some of the differences in the growth equity model. Our, our entire philosophy for 40 years of our history has been, how can we be a great partner to entrepreneurs? We don't buy companies, we partner with people. And that subtlety is something I think a lot of larger firms didn't really pick up when they built their franchises. So they've they've retracted and, and we see a much more favorable competitive environment. So that environment is really good for deal making. You see a lot of opportunities. Mm-hmm. What about exits? Because it feels like for the past three years, LPs have said, where is our cash? Yeah, yeah, they have. You're right. And they still ask that. Yeah. Um, listen, the good news is, at least I can, I'll talk about my portfolio. I can tell you that we continue to see great performance. So the underlying fundamental performance of our portfolio is very strong. The question we always come back to with our LPs is, why would you want us to sell great businesses in a bad market? And so right now, I think there's a real debate and a discussion we're having with LPs, which is, we think we have a winning set of portfolio companies. Let's wait for the right exit environment to come. Um, That said, we've seen, if you take our history, a real balanced outcome in liquidity between the IPO market, selling to a later stage investor or selling to a consolidator, right, an industrial. And one of those parts right now is completely shut. The IPO for the last two years has, has really generated no capital right. formation. Actually, amazingly, in our portfolio, we've only had two IPOs that were both in India and both hugely successful. But in the rest of the world, that's that's an area we would really right. like to see some movement. It's a market that, unless you have a big company, maybe like a Shein, which you're an investor in, that that's something that can be successful in this market. But the smaller, small cap, mid-market, maybe non-tech related, mm-hmm. hasn't really been coming to market. It hasn't really been valued by fundamental yeah. investors. Has something changed? You know, I think there's a lot of analysis to be done on how the 2021 vintage of IPOs has performed because it was such a bonanza in the IPO market. And what you realize a few years in is that people who went too soon without the right stability and recurrence in their business, people were too small, so that mid-market have really been punished as soon as they've had a slowdown. And so I think there's a realization, and same in our portfolio, that when you go public, you need to be prepared for this quarterly scrutiny. You need to be prepared for... Uh, attracting the right investor type. And that, that I think, is a, a defining moment now for the IPO markets mm-hmm. now. Um, we think we have a whole set of companies that are at a scale, growth, quality of model, quality of management that could reopen the markets, and we're eager to see it happen. One of the things also that really underpins Jay's business is, is your very global nature. Mm-hmm. I know you've been very active in China, but we're at a yeah. moment where you could have a great thesis about a Chinese company, but you could get a president that turns away around the next day and slaps an 100% tariff on it, or Congress passes some legislation that says you got to ban or, or sell yourself, not to name any yeah. specific companies. But how do you think about investing in China with that background? Has it changed the way that you invest in that country? Yeah, a few things there. The first is... It feels like we've been navigating tough geopolitics forever in an odd way. Um, And if you look at the impact that that's had on the performance of our portfolio, it's actually been relatively small, right? Our portfolio last year, despite all the noise, grew 36%. We expect that to continue. So the trends that we're backing haven't been impacted by these geopolitics. Um, And that's true almost globally, right? In Europe, we've had Brexit. We've had, you you know, and yet the portfolio is performing really strongly. I think the case of China is an interesting one because we've been there... For over 20 years, it's been a hugely successful market for us. We've built a wonderful franchise. We have a great team. But it's true that there is a new overlay of risk that needs to be managed, which is this geopolitical tension. Um, Now, we're still committed. We're constructive on that market. We're seeing great investment opportunity. I think it's just another layer of risk management that we have to take into account in our underwriting. Does that mean you've you've pulled back a little bit on deal-making? A little bit. I think in certain sectors there's some binary risk that's hard to measure, right? So like certain pieces of life sciences, certain pieces of high tech, we've had to pull back a bit. Also with environment, there's there's a huge story there too of onshoring, reshoring. Mm-hmm. Think about BYD. Again, this is another environment, putting on your head of climate hat, where you could say, what a great story in an uh, environmentally friendly company. It's yeah. making green tech. It's doing EVs. But all of a sudden, again, overnight, you have that story change. Is there a problem in this world where you have these environmental stories that can no longer exist because of the political environment? I don't think so. I think the trend towards a sustainable economy is one that will continue its course come what may. I think there's going to be bumps on the road because of geopolitics, which is a real shame. Mm. But at least in the early stages of our climate strategy, as you know, we've been building this now for four years, the momentum behind it is unbelievable. 
across all stakeholders, right? We see it from government, we see it from corporate, we see it from entrepreneurs, we see it from consumers. So I think you're right, we're going to have to navigate this, but the direction of travel to us is pretty obvious and is, is hugely positive. Gabe, thank you so much for joining. See, we had to get climate in there. We couldn't leave you, we couldn't let you go without it. Matt, that's Gabe Cayo. He is the co-president and head of EMEA and head of climate at General Atlantic. All right, Danny, thanks so much. Danny Berger there at Super Return over in Berlin. Now let's get more on that breaking news from uh, Federal Appeals Court. It struck down the SEC's rules requiring hedge funds and private equity firms to detail quarterly fees and expenses to investors. Bloomberg's Wall Street correspondent Shanali Basic joins us now with more. So uh, Shanali, what does this mean, I guess, for transparency in the industry? A few things. We know that the SEC has sought a lot more transparency from hedge funds, from family offices. And when we look at these private funds rules now, this is the U.S. Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals in New Orleans saying uh, that the rules aren't necessary for highly sophisticated investors in line with what the lawsuit had said brought forward really by very specific industry groups. The Managed Funds Association, I've got to say, in this round, they have been fighting hard against many of the SEC's rules against the private funds industry. And they have have been making significant gains, not only, Matt, to water down existing rules, but also really come up and block rules like this one that would have required hedge funds, private equity firms to have a lot more disclosure when it comes to fees uh, and otherwise. So um, the SEC losing this battle, um, does it look like they've been losing more battles lately? Not technically. They have definitely made a lot of strides in making sure that the industry has more oversight. But to the point that you're making, they haven't won everything. And, of course, we're in an election year. Let's see what next year looks like. All right, Shanali, we're going to continue, obviously, talking about this throughout the day. Shanali Basic there covers Wall Street for us here on Bloomberg TV. Uh, take a look at what's going on in terms of stocks. About 26 minutes after the opening bell, we do see gains. Uh, the S&P 500 up a third of 1%, 53.08. So getting back closer to the high that we hit on May 21st. This was the countdown to the open. I'm Matt Miller. This is Bloomberg.